please subscribe, hit that like button, and as always, leave a comment, and thank you for enjoying the video. Shot to right, slicing toward the pesky pole, down the line, and it's going to be out of here! Line down the right field line toward the pesky pole, leaping up, and that ball is gone! That's a home run! A lot of our Nesson team as well. High fly down the right field line, headed toward the pesky pole, that one tucked in, and that ball is going to be against the wall and into second base. Number retired, and now Rafael Devers trying to retire that baseball inside the pesky pole. Welcome everybody to another episode, episode 79 of the Pesky Podcast. I'm your host, The Rit. With me, like always, is the OG George Sutherland, my man, my co-host, DC. And we are brought to you by Boston Sports Entertainment Network. It is that we are 26 hours, I'm, I'm counting down roughly, 26 hours and change before we, uh, the Red Sox go live on opening day. We play the Seattle Mariners. And with me and my uh, co-host today to bring us the Seattle Mariners is Dakota Esri. Dakota, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, what, besides maybe living in the area, but what brings you uh, some fond memories of the Seattle Mariners? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. Um, really, really an honor to be on here. First time being on here. So first time for that. Um, as far as Mariners goes, for me, my fandom started when I was, you know, four or five years old my grandpa was showing me shout out to the vhs tapes back to him you know life was simple and cheap back to then so uh the my oh my the 1995 season really kind of installed and kind of made my whole fandom and it's only gotten stronger and as the years go on and uh this year looks to be a pretty exciting thing for our mariners and we have a whole lot to uh, look forward to and to root for as well Yes, yeah, so let's go with a quick DC and George. How excited are you guys? We'll start with you, DC. Opening day, 26 hours and counting. You know, well, this is probably the longest. And when you're podcasting, it's, it's, it even makes it longer, I think, when, when there's not a, a lot of moves. But DC, well, what are your thoughts? You know, opening day tomorrow. Uh, they start the big road trip, and it's usually not that good for the Red Sox uh, on a big West Coast road trip. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm very, very excited. It's been a pretty slow off season, you know, to probably a lot of fans, including myself, but ready to let go of the negativity. Day one starts tomorrow. Anything can happen. That's what I love about baseball. Um, obviously, I hope it goes better than the last time we started a season in uh, Seattle. I think it was 2019. Chris Sale got completely shelled, and they lost like 12 to 4 to the Mariners. Um, but yeah, just really excited to see players like Seti, Rafaela, um, see how Story, you know, comes back and performs, you know, off injury. Obviously, his start in Boston hasn't been the most uh, ideal, but uh, yeah, and to see Bell, uh, Bayo take the mound, I'm excited to see what he does this year. But uh, just overall, man, I'm stoked to have baseball back. Stoked to honestly get back to gambling on some baseball. Hopefully, win some money. But uh, yeah, man, I can't, I can't really uh, put it into words how excited I am. Well, uh, I'm glad you brought up the Bayo start. Uh, of course, guys, uh, head on over to our Twitter page uh, for the Pesky Podcast. Follow us, retweet. There is a contest going on. If Bayo gets the W uh, for opening day, we're giving away a brand new design uh, Ryan Bayo uh, t shirt, strikeouts for all. Uh, so make sure you head on over there and check that out. George, how excited are you for opening day with the Red Sox? Way past time. You know, in a, in a winter that's just been just brutally slow uh, in terms of baseball news and expectations, negativity, and everything. I'm with DC. Let's shed the negativity. Baseball's finally here. I'm more than ready. It's just it's just time. Let's get it. Let's get it going. Yeah, it stinks a little bit that you know they the have to start on the West Coast, uh, but that's all right. I'll be up watching every inning, so not a problem. Yeah. So let's uh, let's get started, uh, Dakota. What, what we usually do 
is we start with the with, with the pitching matchups. You know, it's a four game series, so we're going to be seeing pretty much our entire pitching staff, you know, going head to head. And uh, we're going to start off with the Red Sox are, are thrown out in game one for the for opening day. Bayo, you guys are throwing out uh, Castillo. The so, Rock. man, just sit there. Let, let's uh, let's talk about uh, what can the, the Red Sox fans, the Red Sox nation, what can we expect, you know, with your number one A starter? Well, first and foremost, when the Mariners went out and acquired Castillo from the Reds at the trade deadline two years ago, it was really the first time that this ownership and Jerry and Justin Hollander uh, really committed to this team and said, we're willing to make it better. And Castillo has been a massive part of that. What you can expect from Castillo on the mound is your ace, top five Cy Young. Typically, in years past, Castillo has been a slow uh, grinder. He builds up his innings. He builds up his velo as he goes start to start. But with this uh, with this season and with, with uh, his numbers in spring training, his velo is up considerably more than normal. I'm anticipating almost normal prime Castillo. Six, seven innings, probably two earned runs, three tops, depending upon how aggressive the Red Sox hitters will be. Um, but he's going to dominate the zone. He's going to play with the sinker in and outside of the zone. And uh, it's really just kind of comes down to what the hitting approach is going to be from Boston and whether or not they're going to attack the sinker or try to attack the some form of an off speed because, you know, he's known for his sinker and his slider, but the circle change might be the something to keep an eye on for in the start. Yeah, okay, Castillo, four opening day uh, starts in his career, and this is the first time back-to-back -back with Seattle. So, you know, we're, we're going to sit there and kind of see – What's uh what's going on with uh, Castillo? Uh, DC, uh, you want to sit there and talk a little bit about Bayo, and you know, what the Seattle fans are looking to see about uh, seeing El Nino pitch. Yeah, I mean, uh, big uh, ground ball hit, uh, pitcher. He had I think like fifty eight percent, you know, ground balls last year. Um, he really reined in his walks, you know, from two thousand twenty two. I mean, he brought that down pretty good. Um, he can get a little little iffy with his command. He'll strike some guys out. I think uh, this year he's going to, you know, take a step forward. I get a little weary, um, you know, opening day, expecting too much, especially with the uh, the pitch count. I know they kind of monitor that earlier in the season, especially with him being a little bit younger. Um, but, yeah, a lot of ground balls. He can strike some guys out. Um, defense is a lot better this year, I think, going into the season. Obviously, last year. I don't know how you get any worse than that. So I think um, having a good defense behind him, especially, you know, inducing as many ground balls as he does. Uh, I think it should uh, fare pretty well, but I don't know how long he's going to go. I think maybe five or six innings could see two to three earned runs, you know, five, six Ks. Yeah. George, you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, you know, he signed the big contract a, a few weeks back. Uh, good for him. Um, I think this is the year you see the true benefits of him working in off, two past off seasons with Pedro Martinez and you know, if you're going to learn from anybody, why not learn from one of the best? So uh, that that that's what I think that Seattle fans should see. He's not Pedro, he's not Pedro, but he's he throws and has that kind of presence about him. And I think that he was he's learned he's learned a lot from him, and he has that presence, and you'll see that a little bit in him. Uh, you know, he, he's not a carbon copy, but got a little bit in him and. So hopefully you'll show that he's yeah, got to get uh, a, uh, do better against left-handers. That's the only yes. thing I'm worried about is the left-handed batters um, taking advantage of them. But uh, that probably be my biggest worry. I forgot to put that in there. My bad. Is that something to anticipate from Bayo uh, being in the PNW? We don't. I mean, I know who Brian, Brian Bayo has been for the last few years with a rising prospect. But is that something to kind of watch out? We, we we've talked about this here in Washington for for what for the Mariners with. Bryce Miller and Brian Wu, that left-handed pitching was a huge thing. So is that kind of a similar conversation for Brian Bayo as well? To some extent, uh, you know, DC's point is, is spot on. Um, when he's when he's on, doesn't matter who comes to the plate, but he sometimes does struggle against lefties. And you'll, you'll know right away because the first two pitches won't be anywhere near the strike zone. You know, but a it, right-handed hitter come up and he'll – you know, he'll throw a slider and it'll it'll break and you know make the battle look stupid. So, 
So game two, Dakota, we're throwing out, uh, which I'm kind of saying after last year, he's going to be our, our bulldog, our workhorse, Nick Pavetta. And he's going up against, uh, you know, he's going up against Kirby. So, well, what can we expect from Kirby? Like, I'm going to be honest. Looking at your one through four that we got, we got to go up against. Like, our pitcher has got something to prove, but you got established young arms out there in Seattle, and the first time in quite some time out there in Seattle. But tell yeah. us a little bit about Kirby. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, Kirby, known for his pinpoint aim. I mean, his his ability. A lot of people compare him to Greg Maddox and stuff like that, which, I mean, the, the comp is pretty good for his overall control of his pitches. But George Kirby, his biggest calling card in the issue last year was is that he throws, funny enough, too many pitches inside the strike zone. Uh, we saw it last year with Baltimore came into town and hit five-plus home runs off Kirby because they just attacked everything that he threw because they know he doesn't want to throw a ball. Um, as far as our rotation in, in general goes, a lot of people make comparisons to like the mid '90s Braves, 2000 Braves with with Smoltz and Maddox and Glavin and all those guys. So yeah, our we have, in my opinion, the best rotation in baseball, uh, one through five. I mean, there's a couple other ones that can be in similar conversation, but George Kirby is going to come out. He's going to be the bulldog. He's going to try and incorporate this, you know, a little peek behind the scenes for you guys. I don't know if you saw this last year with the bat versus Corey Seager. He threw a knuckleball on Tim Wakefield's passing. Um, he says he's going to throw one per per game. I don't know if that's conjecture. I don't know if that's smoke up the uh, smoke up the skirt. Who knows? But you guys are in for, for a treat. Always watching George Kirby is, is a real pleasure. And uh, we'll see what your guys' approach is very similar with Castillo versus Kirby because he's going to try to attack. He's going to try and get you guys to swing at pitches outside of the strike zone. And it's a matter of, you know, can you stay disciplined at your guys' approach? Yeah, um, I, I know in spring training, uh, our, some of our batters are a bit more patient uh, trying to get it. But if, if they know Kirby's going to be coming at them, like I, I'm kind of excited for that matchup a little more now just, just for the fact is if they can put the ball on the play, we've got some speed on our team that can go from first to third, you know, and turn – Jaron Duran's one of them that can turn a single into a double in a heartbeat. So, but Kirby is going up against uh, Nick Pavetta, the Bulldog himself. Uh, George, you want to sit there and tell uh, Seattle fans a little bit about Nick Pavetta? Sure. Seattle fans remember Nick Pavetta from last year. You are going to look at an entirely different pitcher this year. Nick Pavetta started the year in the rotation last year, pitched his way out of the rotation into the bullpen. Didn't want to go there. Um, and then said – okay, it's not about me, it's about the team. Suddenly, while he was in the bullpen, he started working with a sweeper. He started incorporating that in his relief appearances, and by the end of the season, he had worked his way back into the rotation. With the sweeper, he's gone from pretty much a north-south pitcher to now he's got a, a, a ball that travels east-west. Okay, that movement has made all the difference and made him a much more effective pitcher. He's always had the ability to go long and, and throw fairly significant innings, you know, over 150. Okay. Uh, always have that ability. But now that his ball has movement, he becomes much more devastating. He came into camp way ahead of everybody else. They had to like throttle him back a little bit because he's, he's on, he's on a mission to prove that a, he, he deserves to be in the starting rotation and B, you know, he's coming up on his last year before free agency. So he's playing for a contract. So you're, you, you should see a very, very good outing from him. DC, uh, anything you want to sit there and add uh, for Pavetta? No, he touched on it, right? Uh, you know, pretty much everything I would have said, uh, the biggest thing I'm excited about is a sweeper that he, uh, he started, you know, adding to his repertoire. Um, and I just, I just love Nick Favetta. He has that energy. He wants the ball. Uh, I think he's going to be the high energy guy for the rotation this year. Okay. I did see on a side note here. Um, I noticed that he was at our driveline complex this off season. Nick was um, working on some things. It's a pretty established pitching lab here in, in Seattle. Um, and yeah, I mean, based off his 10 and nine record and a 404 ERA, it looks like he's got a good baseline to build from. So that's going to be a really intriguing pitching matchup. And I'll actually be there for that, for that game as well. Oh man, that, that, that's that's a, that's a really good one, 
you know, because because both pitchers are, are going to be given it all. Uh, Pavetta is in a contract year, so you know he, he definitely wants to be able to you know show his worth. So, uh, game three, you know, we're throwing out there, you know, my man right there, Cutter Crawford. I love me some Cutter Crawford, and and you guys throwing out there Gilbert. Mm-hmm. So Dakota, tell us a little bit about Gilbert and. Uh, what can we expect from him, man? Logan, he is, uh, he's the engineer. That's kind of our nickname in our, my little friends group for him because he's got a bag of tools that I've never seen before. You know, as a, as a baseball advocate, my whole life, I've never seen a pitcher have like a bag of 20 plus tools where he has a, you know, a soaking wet ball in one thing. And then he's got a different stretching band and stuff. So he's constantly working, constantly tank, uh, tinkering. But with Logan Gilbert, first and foremost, it's his extension. His extension to home plate makes the whole pitching, uh, his arsenal just deadly. He incorporated a splitter off season, which he worked a lot of time on. Uh, cutter as well as like an inside sinker a little bit for his repertoire and spring training. Don't know if that'll translate to regular season. But with Logan... You're going to see a guy who's going to attack you at top, uh, top of, of the zone, fastball, 95-97, uh, splitter, heavy, heavy slider. The slider has been a huge incorporating part, and he's going to want to make you guys to chase. It's kind of the whole theme as the Mariners, you know, we dominate our zone or CTZ, control the uh, zone. So if Logan's able to do that and kind of dictate how what pitches are swung at and which pitches aren't, easier said than done, that will kind of dictate what, what the game goes for. But with Logan... You're going to have a lot of moving parts and the hair is going to be moving in two different directions and he's just going to be really fiery. So this is going to be a fun matchup and Cutter Crawford is one interesting man to watch as well. Yeah, I'm a huge Cutter Crawford fan. Uh, Last year on the podcast, uh, we were talking and we threw out the prediction of who was going to get the most wins for the Red Sox. And I threw Cutter Crawford's name out there. Once again, uh, I sit there and uh, saying that Cutter Crawford is going to be our guy uh, this year. Uh, looking at his spring training, this is a different g- guy. You know, this is the year I'm saying that he's going to take that step forward. Where looking at his spring training, he was one, he, five games, 1-0, 3.72 ERA, 18 strikeouts, and a 1.09 whip. Yes, it's spring training. People were working on things. But when you're working on things and they're all going in your favor, man, that is absolutely, uh, as my man George would say, totally nasty. Be totally nasty. Be totally nasty. <laughs> so, welcome to my it, world, Dakota. It, hey, hey, round of applause. It, that was wonderful <laughs> editing. Good, good, good cut. Here, here, here on on the Pesky Podcast, and, and we're we're gonna get the get to uh, a little bit later when we're going to give our prediction of who is going to be getting the totally nasty award we give on the pesky podcast for the best pitching performance of the series. So Dakota, that's a little something to think about uh, a little bit, but man, this matchup is going to be really great. And I can actually see Cutter Crawford, you know, going at the Seattle Mariners lineup, uh, and, and, and coming and coming at him where he's going to be successful. And that's the key thing to be successful with the pitching Uh, in spring training. Once again, it's spring training. It doesn't really count, but we had the second best ERA in spring training. And a lot of people were like, Oh, is that Andrew Bailey? Is that Breslow? Is this a a new, uh, you know, uh, new way they're working things in spring training. Uh, I've talked to, talked to different pitchers, Steele Denlinger, uh, Maceo Campbell, uh, and they all said that, you know, the spring training pitching, they're working differently. They're adding pitches, you know, they, they get more comfortable. They're, they're expecting them to execute their pitches that they do feel comfortable throwing. So it, this is a completely different, uh, different bull, like starting rotation, but it technically is the same one from last year, almost. So uh, it's going to be really exciting to see this match with Cutter Crawford and uh, Logan Gilbert, which will lead us into our fourth matchup, which is finally a little bit of afternoon evening game for us East Coast people where, you know, we got 
Whitlock. We're hoping it's going to be Whitlock, uh, Whitlock then. You know, Rob, shout out to you. And he's going, he's going up against uh, Miller for, you know, the Mariners. So Dakota, let's, uh, let's sit there and talk a little bit about Miller and what can we expect? Well, I mean, when you think Bryce Miller, the first thing that comes to my mind, no movie pun intended, it's, he's just big Texas. He's got big attitude. He's got big flair. Um, when you think of Bryce Miller for us, he's still so raw. Um, when I think of what he can – this match, this pitching matchup is probably the one that I'm the least confident in just because we just don't know what to expect from Bryce Miller. Last year was his rookie year. He came up. He had a big fastball. Everybody knew about 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 his fastball, but he didn't really have anything else. Um, you guys talked about um, the sweeper previously. That's something that he's tried to incorporate, but the splitter's kind of been our thing in our camp this year, and that's something Bryce Miller has been trying to work on and induce more ground balls. You guys talked about that with Brian Bale earlier too about trying to get inducing more more ground balls, limiting pitch count. The similar conversation is going to be applicable for, for Bryce Miller. So with with Miller. You guys are going to want to be as aggressive as you can. Every fastball that he throws, swing. Don't hesitate. Um, Dever, story, be aggressive in early counts. And then, you know, the last thing you want is deal with our bullpen. That's the last thing anybody wants to deal with. So, Yeah, and, and, and he's going up against uh, Whitlock, who had a very impressive spring training. So, uh, DC, do you want to sit there and take uh, at Whitlock? Yeah, I'll take him. Um, yeah, he has that hard guarding slider that we've always, we've seen a couple of clips in uh, in spring training. He has a really low arm slot, so that also gives some sinking action to his fastball. It sits usually about 93, 96. Um, and he also, he's pretty, just like I said about Bayo, he's a ground ball pitcher. Uh, the only thing that worries me, like uh, the next guy we're going to talk about, is just getting through the, you know, the third time through the lineup. Um, the last guy we just talked about, Crawford, I uh, was reading on him earlier. He only averaged 77 and a half pitches per start. You need a little bit more than that from a guy, uh, from a starter. That's another thing I worry about with Whitlock is, you know, staying in the game. He'll come out, you know, firing in all c- cylinders and then one inning, he'll just kind of fall apart. And then that just blow- balloons the pitch count, digs into the bullpen like we did all last year, um, which obviously we know how that turned out. Everybody was gassed by, you know, what, end of July, August. Um, but yeah, if he can uh, just maintain his pitches, get those outs, especially with a good defense like I referenced before, I think he'll have a solid season. But this is definitely a big prove it season, so I think he comes out, you know, with the fire underneath him. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Dakota, you said you had a, uh, a a stat about Cutter. Go ahead with that. Yeah. So just doing a little bit of the Statcast OTC research on him. There's two reports about Cutter Crawford that kind of caught my eye. One. 87th and 88th percentile and exit batting average and exit velo like out off of him very impressive uh looks like doesn't limit a whole whole lot of uh, hard contact but something this is more for your eyes alley than me my the reports i read was that he threw two different curveballs and he threw two different kinds of off speed i saw a split finger and i saw a circle change now which one of those is accurate out of curiosity george uh i believe I suppose a decent change. Uh, don't remember him throwing much of a splitter. His stuff plays up. So, yeah, that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah, I just from I just from from the article I read, somebody was saying, "Oh, well, the split finger was thrown eight something percent, and that was roughly the same percentage as the change up." And sometimes, you know, the gun picks up the wrong pitch. I just wasn't sure if right. the article was just a little bit off, or maybe he is trying to throw a new pitch. So I figured I'd ask. Yeah, he's got a, when he gets in trouble, he throws a good slider, but when he gets in trouble, he gets it up and it backs up a little bit. And that happened to him the last spring training outing. But yeah, I, I don't ever remember throwing a split at UDC. No, I haven't. When I, uh, once he said that, I mean, unless I'm not paying too much attention, but I haven't, I don't think I've seen him throw that. Okay. Now, now, the, the, this is a little shout out to, you know, ITM pod. Isn't Cutter the the pitcher on on our team that you know destroyed every animal mascot that he went against last year? Was that Cutter Crawford? I'm not too much. I'm not you know up on the uh, the mascot the, the matches. <laughs> oh, oh man. Well, well, we're, we're gonna sit there and, and have to look into that a little more. So yeah, we can check but, that out. Uh, 
But yeah, uh, so which pitching matchup do you guys, you know, games one through four, which ones are you guys the most excited to see? DC, let's start with you. I'm going to go with uh, Whitlock. I mean, obviously, I love Bayo. Um, you know, he's solidified in that rotation, and Cutter Crawford has earned that right as well. Um, I think Whitlock and uh, Hauk are the ones that have a lot to prove. Um, I, I'm excited to see how he comes out, especially if it's really decent uh, spring training. And uh, I'd have to go Whitlock. Okay, Dakota, what, what matchup are you most uh, happy to see this? I think for me, it's probably Kirby versus Nick uh, for me because Kirby's ascending or his ascending role in this team is incredibly valuable. And to see him start off on the right foot would be important. So I definitely would probably take game two. And I'm just really curious to see what this Nick Pavetta guy has put in as far as new pitches and how we look. So that's my that's my choice personally. OG, George? Uh, for me, it's uh, Bayo and Castillo. I mean, Castillo is a terrific pitcher, and you know we were all hoping that uh, Bayo uh, assumes the mantle of quote ace on the staff. So uh, I'm really going to see how he, he does his first opening day, young kid. You know, I'm really looking to see how he matches up, and you know, watching the ability of Castillo works for me. It's like I always I love good pitching, so yeah, I'm excited to see a good matchup. Well, it's, it's kind of ironic that we all chose different because the one I'm most excited to see is Cutter Crawford and Gilbert. So it's kind of like we, we all guessed. went around. Who, who would have guessed? You know? No, it's good that we were all different, though. Usually we're uh, at least two of us are on the same page. So get some variety going. Awesome. Yeah. So so let's, uh, let's go right now, guys. We're, we're going to do it right now before we switch things over to the hitting side. Who will be totally nasty? Who is going to be and get the what? first ever totally nasty award for this series? So let's sit there and start off with the man that the award is after, the OG. So George, who do you, who who are you going to be saying gets the totally nasty award? Based on watching him pitch. And knowing he has the capability of doing it and having him seen it done it before, Garrett Whitlock. He will he will make a batter just look incredibly foolish. And you'll go, wow. Again, totally nasty. Hit the button. <laughs> <word. laughs> be totally nasty. <laughs> I'm gonna cue it up. Phone alarm. Phone alarm. <laughs> so okay, Let's Dakota. <laughs> I know you're not going to take a Red Sox. So what? What Seattle pitcher is is, is going is your uh, going to get your totally nasty award? Well, you know, unfortunately, I don't have the wonderful button to press myself. But uh, what I, what I can it's say totally is, typically, nasty. I would have said Matt Brash. Unfortunately, Matt Brash is hurt right now. I mean, he's one of the nastiest pitchers in baseball. But I'm going to go Andres Munoz, and I know we'll we'll get in the bullpen here in, in a bit, but. He, we call him Senior Smoke. The dude throws 102. He incorporated a heavy sinker in the offseason. He's been throwing his slider. He's fully healthy. Um, and all, all I can say is, is if it gets to the ninth inning and the lights turn out and the flames start going all over the field, it's going to be really fun to watch. So, Oh, man, okay. Uh, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of hoping it doesn't get to that ninth inning, you know, a little bit. That's personally uh, my big thing. But we've kind of got a two, three-headed monster, you know, on our side. But we're, we're going to discuss that uh, a little bit later with the bullpen. DC, who do you got for this series? It'd be totally nasty. Well, you would never guess it, but I had what George had. George had. Um, I think Whitlock has this stuff, man. You know, we just saw it in his most recent start. Was it last night or two nights ago? Um, just dirty, dirty slider. Uh, I'll... I'll pick one just to, you know, you know, spread it out a little bit. I think Bayo, I'm really excited to see that slider in action, you know, first game tomorrow. So I'll cop out a little bit there, but I was going to go Whitlock. Sorry, buddy. Oh, man. No, you're good, man. Hey, hey, hey it, it's all good because, you know, we every, – you guys already know who I'm going to pick, but just when you sit there and think you know the answers, I'm changing the questions, and I'm going Nick Pavetta. I I, I wow. want to sit there and say Pavetta is going to go out there and get totally nasty. Uh, he, he wanted that opening day start. 
And I so wanted I, I was one of the guys that was like, let Pavetta get the opening day out in Seattle. Let Bayo have opening day at home at Fenway. You know what I mean? They both deserve it in for different ways. So I'm saying Pavetta is going to go out there uh, and he's going to be the totally nasty uh, award for my part. So, man, I, I love all of our picks that we had so far. But now it's time for us to switch things up and let's go to our starting lineups. Can I, can I ask so, a question real quick? Yeah, DC, go ahead. Yeah, Dakota, can you? Because obviously we just got uh, Campbell from you guys. Is there anything you can tell us about him to look out oh, for? Oh, yeah, man. First and foremost, um, Mariners Land was not happy to lose Isaiah Campbell. Isaiah Campbell, interesting profile, young guy, 26 years old, got five-plus years of club of, uh, of club ownership over him. Fastball changeup guy. Uh, changeup is, is his calling card. Wasn't really known for any slider. Wasn't known for a sweeper. Wasn't known for a curveball. He's just going to go walk up there with fastball changeup. Nothing fancy about it. He's going to keep you off balance. And he'll be someone, if he can grow, will be a really valuable part of your guys' bullpen for, for years going forward. I love me a good bullpen piece, man. I love yep. it. D DC, uh, Dakota, you weren't here last year. DC was huge when last year when we signed uh, Martin. Like he, that was his his big acquisition, and it was phenomenal how well he played out for us uh, throughout the season. And he was very key. Uh, he was banged up a little bit spring training, but uh, I really sit there and, and think that he, you know he can be be. Now going back to a one point something ERA again, but I can see him, you know, in low threes. So, yeah, he's definitely my Chris Martin of twenty twenty four. Yeah, the the profile is very very similar, and uh, the best part is he's got killer facial hair game, man. You guys will love him in Boston. Oh, uh, yeah, mustache man. He's got command and a mustache. Yes, big old handlebar. Oh man, him and Wink uh, have him battle the uh, the stashes. So. <laughs> But let's go opening day uh, lineups. Uh, let's sit there and, and we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. Uh, do you would you guys prefer going position by position, or you know technically what could be the, our our lineup in order? I mean, I have both available. It's whatever you guys is easiest for forever, everybody else. Okay, let's uh, let's sit there and, and let's go ar around the bag. Let's start at at first base. You know, we've got the young Tristan Casas, uh, me Casas, Asu Casas. So, and then you guys got uh, Ty France, and he's, you know, he's got some power behind him, too. So, tell a little bit about uh, Ty France. Well, uh, speaking of power and Ty France, this will be a funny short uh, little story here. So, Ty France oh, yeah. last year was just not really athletic for the profile to be kind um guy got after in the offseason though uh lost looked like he lost probably 20 25 pounds leaned up uh when it, he lived sleep i mean i think he pretty much rented a, a drive line this offseason um so with the profile of france we just hope he can find the power i know you were referencing earlier but it just hasn't been there um, two years ago, uh, he was just doctor automatic. Every time he got up to the plate, it was spray the ball, to right field, spray the ball, to left field, hit it up the middle. Um, just didn't really have a lot of over the fence power. That's what they're hoping with the increase of the bat speed, like a plus three miles an hour on his exit speed, exit below a drive line in the off season. So we're just hoping that we can maybe get the actual tie France. Cause to be honest in Mariners land, this is really the last make or break year for Ty France because we have prospects coming up behind him that, that are pushing. So we'll be hoping he has power. Nothing like Tristan Cassis. I mean, that guy's got light tower power. But um, if he can hit 270 with 20 home runs and 80 plus RBIs and play the same level of defense, that's a win, three win season for us at first base. Okay. And representing us, DC, uh, let's sit there and talk me, Casas, and Sue Casas. Yeah, I mean, obviously last year wasn't the best start. Um, he had a rough two months, but, you know, what rookie doesn't, you know, go through those little hiccups. But uh, he'll strike out a good bit, but his on-base percentage was like 368 last year. He can really drive the ball. Um, I think his uh, home run total will definitely 
balloon a little bit more. I think he had like 26 last year. I think his RBIs go up with more guys on base as long as we're not running into outs like we did probably, you know, 90% of the time. Um, but yeah, he'll walk. It gets on base. I think uh, his approach is going to be even more tuned up this year. You know, he has a year under his belt. I just expect uh, big things from him. Yeah, uh, I'm a huge Casas fan. I think that we will not see no sophomore slump from him, you know, overall. Yeah. Uh, so let's go second base. You know, you guys over there get picked up a veteran, Polanco. Uh, I, I really love – you guys have – like looking, you guys picked up some great veterans to add to your young uh, lineup that you guys had. And second base, they're saying potentially Valdez could be Reyes. Uh, so, George, we'll let you take Valdez uh, and but Dakota. Let's talk about Polanco here. I mean, Jorge Polanco kind of comes as advertised. Switch hitting, capability, power from both sides of the plate. Been a twin for most of his entire career. Um, just, a, just a pro's pro. You know, uh, he's very, very close relationship-wise with Julio Rodriguez, which we'll probably get into here in a bit. Um, but when, when you look at the second base hole for the Mariners, last season was the worst I have ever seen in, in my entire watching fandom life. Colton Wong was awful, to put it kindly. <laughs> he was quite literally the worst rated hitter in all of baseball last season up until the All-Star break. So anything, not to be disrespectful to Colton Wong, but anything's better than what we had last year. And um, no, it's just a, it's a nice excitement and a refreshing thing to have. After Robinson Cano left, we really haven't had anything at second base. So having a veteran presence in the middle of the order who can provide a hit from both sides of the plate, play mediocre defense and put up, you know, 20 home runs, 20, 25 doubles, or, you know, a similar stat line to what we need to see from second base versus what we've seen in years previously. So Polanco, great addition. Um, and it's a welcome addition at that. Yeah. Uh, George, you want to go over Valdez? Sure. I mean, going into the season, we thought that Vaughn Grissom, the, the player we got from the Braves when we traded away Chris Sale was going to be the opening day second baseman. Uh, he's hurt. So uh, they've had to revert to the guy who played a lot of second base for the Sox last year, uh, and Manuel, and Manuel Valdez, who came over uh, in a, a, a trade from the Astros in the previous season. Uh, the big thing with Valdez is his defense can be pretty bad at times, okay? And the Sox have kind of looked at him and said, look, what we want you to do is Make the simple plays, all right? Just do that. We're not going to try and make it into a goal glover. If you just make simple plays, you know, everything will be fine, and they can kind of hang on. At the plate, you know, he look, you know, he's got that that, you know, prep like Juan Soto. You know, uh, you know, every time he comes to the plate, he looks like Juan Soto with the twirl on the bat and everything. And the other thing is. He has some surprise power. I mean, he drove one the other night in a spring training oh, game. That was that a just, piss missile. My goodness. I mean, that just got out of there in a hurry. Uh, so he, ha he has power. Um, has the ability to slap the ball the other way as well. But, yeah, you know, when he connects, the, it, it, you know, he can drive the ball out of the ballpark. Uh, you know, defense is going to be the key. Um, it's, it was a hole for us last year it, uh, until they figure out what they've got in Grissom. It's going to be a hole for this year as well. Uh, so you know, two situations very much similar for both teams. Yeah, I am I personally would rather have Reyes there uh, a little more, you know, yes. regularly there. So, but overall, I think a platoon of those two, maybe even throw, you know, Rafaela in there. Uh, possibly, uh, I think we could sit there and, you know, be okay at second base until, you know, we figure out uh, uh, what Grissom, because Grissom, he's going to spend a lot of time, I think, down in AAA at the beginning of the season to once he comes back from the IL. So, uh, hey Carson, what, what exactly ahead. was the injury on Vaughn Grissom? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a groin injury. Um, That's the worst. Yeah. Uh, although they are talking by the end, they are talking he's going to stay down to Florida 
and you know what happens the second second week of April is they and where they put him will tell you a lot. So yeah, okay. So uh, let's go. Let's continue around the diamond, and you guys got at shortstop uh, J.P. Crawford, and he, he's exciting excitement in a bottle. Yeah. Uh, at, at shortstop DC, uh, you're, you're going to bring us some Trevor Story because this it's uh, it's spring training. It was definitely story time, and he was close to the book there uh, at will. So Dakota, uh, let's talk about Crawford. Man, I mean, first and foremost, he is the captain. He is the captain of our team. He is the stir that, you know, that does our drink. He does everything. Um, he's the one that really kind of assumed the mantle after Kyle Seeger retired. And he's been everything we could have ever hoped for at shortstop. Gold glove defense. Um, last season, he's coming off a five-war season, which is incredible for, you know, years previously. He was 3 to 3.4 on, on a really good year. And he found the power. Uh, I know I reference the driveline a lot. We've, it's been a huge success for us here in uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. That J.P. Crawford spent a lot of time down there. His uh, bat speed, speed uh, the exit below was tremendous. The defense, the just the locker room presence. J.P. Crawford is what any team out of, you know, besides for, you know, if you want to place Mookie Betts, whoever plays shortstop for the Dodgers these days, um, or Trey Turner. These are about the best as you, as you, you can get. You know, uh, De La Cruz, fun as well. But when you're looking of a stalwart, you're thinking of a captain, you're thinking of somebody who is the face of your franchise. J.P. Crawford is that man, and we are so blessed and thankful to have him here. Well, Dakota, uh, as, as DC, I'm sure is going to be mentioned here. Uh, Trevor Story, in my opinion, will be our captain uh, for this team. Uh, and he, he's sitting there. He took a lot of uh, younger guys to his camp this year, worked with them, helped them out. So, DC, uh, let's sit there talk about Trevor Story. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, he's really stepped up as far as a leadership um, department. Um, obviously, the last two seasons, he's probably played 140 games total, if that, for uh, Boston, which obviously, you know, getting that type of money, you would like to see a little bit more. But a little bit of uh, unlucky injuries, you know, getting hit in the hand two years ago. Um, but, yeah, and the spring training, I know small sample size. I don't get too caught up in spring training, but it was uh, very relieving and exciting to see how he tore it up. Hit like 380, uh, three home runs, four doubles. He had like a 440 on base percentage. Like I said, very wow. small uh, um, sample size. But I, I see him coming out. We talked on in the last show. I think he can hit, you know, 20, 25 home runs, if not creep up to 30 if he's fully healthy. And I think he's also going to get uh, get up there as far as stolen bases. I, um, I think George even uh, – said it too i think uh he's going to lead a team in stolen bases um but yeah it's just the intangibles that he has you know taking the younger guys under his wing um and the defense he does play obviously he went through the whole kk experience last year in shortstop that's one to to definitely not remember i i try to forget that a lot but somehow i keep bringing it up so i blame myself but i expect big things out of him obviously he's not going to give you the best batting average at this point in his career but if he could be around 330 340 on base you know it's, 775 800 ops um i think that's exactly what we want and then stealing those bags that's something i definitely want to see the team do a lot more and i think it starts with him yeah so uh dakota let's sit there and switch it up to third base uh real quick you got josh rojas over there playing third uh i i remember him from the marlins uh when he played there and uh george well you've got it easy over here baby You've got you, you've got the Devers World Order, the DWO. The so uh, Dakota, let, let's start and talk a little bit about uh, Rojas. Well, I mean, it's for, for us in Seattle. This has been the most questionable part of our off season right now is third base. I mean, it's no disrespect to Josh Rojas, who is a fine player. Um, Luis Arias, which we got from you guys for Isaiah Campbell, he's been. I'm gonna say a question mark is the best way to put Urias. No one really knows what to expect from him. So that just kind of puts more pressure on Josh Rojas. But Rojas, is he's been, you know, I don't like to put too much in stats or, you know, or too much love into spring training info and stuff, stuff like that. But he's pulling the ball more, getting the ball more into the air. The defense being a natural third baseman uh, for Rojas will be good for his natural position. But 
This will be a position that will become something of a highlighted spot here in Seattle. That third base is kind of a no man's land right now because Rojas could hit 250 and 15 home runs and 60 RBIs, or he could hit 220 something and he could be minimal. So it's really, it's kind of a guess who on third base, but at this point in time, uh, they will split between Urias hitting lefties and Rojas hitting righties to try and get the best possible output. But this is something that definitely will be addressed, and that's why Matt Chapman was a huge conversation here in, in the Pacific North and Northwest. Um, if, you got, if you guys could have went and got Chapman too, like, like you, you guys would have been above the Astros and above the Rangers instantly. You know, you, you guys are, in, in my opinion, you guys are like great. Right, it's a three-way, you know, race there. But, man, if you would have had Chapman there, too, with his defense and, and not only that, the leadership, you know, it, it, it would have been great. So, yeah, I think, you know, there was a lot of interest in Chapman in general. Um, Just to wrap it up for on this side of that. Mm -hmm. The only concern was after we traded a Eugenio Suarez in the offseason, the profile of Chapman and Suarez on just pure stats wise are almost identical. Um, it's really kind of concerning. That's why there was a lot of concern about spending the money on him. We all saw how much money he got because of Boris. So that's a different conversation for a different day. But um, interesting, though, because, I mean, Chapman does have a lot of value. I'm um, curious if Urias and Rojas can produce the same offensive level as Chapman. We saw how good Chapman was at the beginning of last season. But then after that, he just spiraled right down the toilet. So I hope the best for him in San Francisco, but yeah, the Mariners are right on, on the pedestal and third base will be something that will be highlighted for sure this season. Yes. Uh, now third base is something that we've got locked up for 10 more seasons. I can't wait. Uh, George, let's talk a little bit about Devers. Yeah. <clears throat> coming into this year, uh, Devers is coming off a, a really down year, uh, 30 home runs, hundred RBIs and a 271 batting average. Uh, while well, most players would be ecstatic, it's not the Devers that we've seen previously. Um, he was a little lost last year at times. Um, he has made a change in the uh, in where he has his hands uh, as, in, as he gets to the plate. And what that's done is now he's hitting the ball with power to the opposite field. So if you've got any of your fans that are out there that uh, – have a seat in the left center field bleachers. Um, yeah, you could get a Raphael Devers souvenir. Uh, he's been he's been hitting the ball hard. Although his last home run in spring training, um, which was against the Rangers, he smashed one down the right field and got out get out of there in a hurry. Uh, he has he has matured, I think, in coming into the season. Last year he was running around. I think he was a little lost. His buddy Sander Bogats was suddenly in San Diego. Um, he had kind of, he kind of treated Devers like a little brother, kind of helped him along a little bit. Uh, the Kike Hernandez experiment, um, was bad. Kike didn't help him any, um, uh, it affected his defense, it affected his offense. I think this year he realizes that he's a bigger, he's a bigger place in the team. He's, he's spoken up to management about, Hey, we need this, you know what we need, let's do it. Um, and he's focused more on his defense. I think Trevor's story at shortstop is going to help him a lot on his defense, covering more ground. Uh, but, yeah, I, we're expecting huge things from him this year. Uh, you know, I said in our prediction show, um, when at the end of the year, I think he's going to hit 40, 40 home runs and knock in 125, 130 runs batted in. So, yeah, big time. Dakota, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, quick question, George. You asked. You man. You mentioned about his growth, right? About this year versus last year, and it was well known. Um, we heard it out here on, on the West Coast. He was very vocal. Rafael Devers was very vocal about calling out uh, ownership, management, spending, uh, roster construction, all of this stuff. Where does that stand now, after a couple weeks or months after these initial comments were made, versus where we stand? You know, where where we stand today versus back then. He hasn't made any public statements since that one. Um, okay. I think he's letting his play talk. Uh, I think he's uh, kind of huddled up around some of the other veterans in the clubhouse. Uh, Trevor Story, 
I think you can, and to some degree, even Tristan Casas, who's kind of assumed a uh, leadership role, even as a year two player, um, you know, he knows they, they, they could have used another pitcher, uh, but he's smart enough not to, you know, go well out and, you know, go full knife attack on, on ownership. He just said it very succinctly, management knows what we need. Okay. And I think that was the thing that Red Sox fans wanted to hear. He, I mean, he's always been a happy-go-lucky kid. You know, he's, you know, very smile on his face. He loves, to, he loves to play baseball. He gets out there, and you know, this is the thing he does, and he has fun while doing it. I, I just think the maturity level. He, he came up as a nineteen-year-old. He's twenty-six years old now, right? You know, like, well, you know, you're a different, you're a different person at, at twenty-six than you are at nineteen. So he's he's kind of grown in that respect, but he hasn't come out and done anything public uh, since that that one little. Uh, public statement that he let out. So I think he's letting his bat talk. Yeah, and he's he's doing, doing a really good job on letting that bat talk. Too. Oh, yeah. So uh, Dakota, well, we're going to go behind the plate now. You guys got Rally, and we got Connor Wong. So uh, DC's got Wong. Uh, but Dakota, you start off with talking about uh, Rally. Well, I mean, this is a perfect comparison you guys look at cal raleigh and probably think of a previous red Sox back to the yesteryear of one jason veritek that's when i looked at him and since he was drafted it's this guy is a carbon copy he is our he is our sergeant he is our you know he is everything for us you know him him and crawford excuse me up in the middle of that field with uh, rodriguez in center the center of, of, the, of the diamond is incredibly tough and it's rock solid cal raleigh has really taken we talked about rafael devers and his growth in, in the previous segment we uh Similar conversation with, with Cal Raleigh. There was a lot of comments on uh, fellow territory with AJ Presinski's podcast. Um, very vocal, but uh, Cal Raleigh is really an. He's probably my second most important piece to this season for our playoff hopes because when you have a catcher like we did last year who hits over thirty home runs and produces the way he does with that uh, defense behind the uh, plate. Cal Raleigh is, I don't know how, one of the most incre like incredibly most underrated players in baseball. I don't know how he doesn't make any lists. Lists are for people who care about that stuff, I guess. But Cal Raleigh is a stud. If he can grow into J. Jason Veritek, I will be reliving my childhood dreams all over again. And I'm sure that would be a great time for all of us. So, yeah, Cal Raleigh is a real treat to watch. So, uh, DC, oh, what, do you, what do you got on Connor Wong? I mean, Connor Wong's in the lineup you know, strictly for his defense. Uh, he doesn't have the greatest stats. You know, he doesn't hit too well as far as average is on bases, you know, not too great. He does have sneaky power, I think, with uh, enough at-bats. I think he had nine last year. I think he could get close to, you know, 10 to 15 home runs, you know, pretty easily. But he does have to cut down on the strikeouts. But like I said, he is in that that lineup strictly for defense. Obviously, throwing base runners out was a was a tough uh, go for the Red Sox, you know, the last couple of years. And last year he was uh, – you know, pretty good at doing so. Um, but like I said, sneaky power. Um, if he cuts down those strikeouts, you know, works the count a little bit, I think uh, he could definitely put up uh, pretty decent numbers for a guy that you're really relying on just for defense. Yeah. Um, if, if we can get Connor Wong a little bit to, to produce a little bit more behind the plate with his bat to equal out his glove, it would be dangerous. But I think as of right now, I think that he's back there, like you said, strictly for defense. And we've got a future that's waiting in the wings, you know, down in, in double way with Kyle Teal. And Kyle Teal, Dakota, is, is someone that kind of reminds me of a Veritech, uh, like a rally, where he can – he is very uh, disciplined behind, behind the plate. His pitching staff respects him. He's got a great bat. And he can control a game very, very easily, just like, you know, you said with Rally. So let's sit there and switch the DH. And, well, Dakota, you got you guys got Mitch Garver. Yeah. Now, like and, – and I'm jealous, it's, man. It, it's, I'm it's, it, it, it's such a coincidence that, you know, Rally being so young just so happens to have – a phenomenal catcher back there, you know, that could help him uh, improve, you know, kind of like how we have Veritech in the dugout that can, that's able to help uh, catchers improve. 
So, and then we've got uh, Masataka Yoshida, George. So let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about your like steal of the off season, you know, with Mitch Garver. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I don't know how Texas let them walk out the door for the price that they did. I'll be honest. I know, obviously, I'm sure you guys talked about it nauseam as I have on, on my podcast. The RSN issues are what they are, which is why a lot of players didn't get retained by teams that I figured that they would, including Mitch Garver. But Garver is a professional hitter. He is what he is. The dude smashes fastballs, which is something I love to watch personally. Um, but, you know, and I watched him, you know, at Texas, um, being a, kind of a closet Twins fan with my family being from the, the Midwest. I've kind of had my eye on Garver for a few years now, but his ability to just put up power is great. But as everybody knows about Mitch Garver, there's only always one thing, and that's kind of be the re- like the, um, a reoccurring theme here for my, 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 my Mariners this year. You got to keep him healthy. You can't let him catch. Don't let him catch. Like, that's why we went out and we acquired a backup catcher in Sebi Zavala. Uh, But Garver is a great hitter. He's going to bring a veteran presence. You know, you mentioned earlier in the podcast about Jorge, uh, that veterans, just bringing in veterans. That's what we need. Guys who can come in, know what they do well, and perform that, you know, at the level that they're expected to, because that's what we've had a problem with lately is just not getting guys to come in that perform to the back of their card. So getting Mitch Garver in the middle of our lineup, just deep, this really makes our lineup so much deeper. A lot of guys like Cal Raleigh, Ty France, other guys that we'll, we'll, we'll get into just to slide down. So great addition by the Mariners. Jerry and Justin did a wonderful job getting Garver. And that was really early in the off season. That was the first legit move we made this off season. So I'm glad that we were able to get him here. Yeah, you guys didn't waste any time. You knew what you wanted, and, you know, you got him right away. So, George, uh, let's sit there and talk about uh, Yoshida. Yoshida played his way into being DH this year. Um, You know, coming in last year, there was – everybody felt that he could hit. Uh, He did, 289, 15 homers, 70, what, two RBIs. Um, Not blessed with great speed. Uh, intelligent base runner, but you know, not really a great outfielder. Um, adequate at best, um, and uh, you know, I think he with the Red Sox refocusing on defense uh, because they were just atrocious last year, 102 errors. Um, I think that you know the front office said, "Nope, we're going to put Mastaka, and you know he's going to be IDH, and he should be a very good one." So, yeah, I mean, I, he's. He's a really good hitter. Um, again, something like he did last year, 290, you know, 29, 290, 295, somewhere in there, 15 home runs, up to 80 RBIs. You know, I'll take that, you know, and uh, that, you know, has some sneaky power as well and can spray the ball everywhere. Typical, typical good Japanese hitter. Yeah, uh, I'm looking for – a more relaxed uh, and a more energy-driven Yoshida this year to where he's not doesn't have to worry about, you know, being in the outfield as much. He's still going to get some playing time out there. Uh, I, I am a little disappointed on how, like, lack of his athletic ability out there was. You know, it wasn't as bad as, you know, years past of trying to watch J.D. Martinez out there uh, be a, tra- a train wreck out there. But man, it's uh, it, it's it's hopefully it's a little bit better. He gets his rest uh, a little more needed uh, because going from Japan, they had off every Monday, you know, on a set schedule. You know, kind of like uh, the way the minor league AAA does. You know, you tra- Monday's your travel day. So uh, we're, we're to sit there and speed things up, we're, we're going to be heading over to the outfield kind of as a whole. And Dakota, you, you guys got uh, Mitch Hanniger, Julio Rodriguez, and I, I really want to call this guy Kazone, you know, but it's uh, Canzone. Canzone? Canzone. Canzone? Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, just, I, I just wanted to throw some flair out there. Canzone, you know? Oh, Jesus. But, uh, <laughs> so. And uh, on our half, we have, of course, we got Jaron Duran, 
uh, well, we dubbed them the Super Smash Brothers, Jaron Duran and Tyler O'Neill. And then we, we, we've got the baby of the bunch now, the future, Sedone Raphael out there uh, in center field. So DC is going to be talking about our outfield. So Dakota, let's uh, let's talk about your, your outfield a little bit there. Okay, well, I mean, first and foremost, the outfield, I'll leave the best for, for last, of course. But, uh, you know, we went out, we acquired Luke Rayleigh from Tampa Bay, a uh, really, really capable player. We got rid of Jared Kelnick. That was an experiment that just was never going to work here in Seattle, unfortunately. So you pair him with uh, Kenzone, as we did earlier. And, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, that's it, the guy. It, that's going that's, worldwide now. That's going huge. <laughs> That's it. That's the signature for uh, Dom, uh, Dom Kenzone. But uh, Kenzone, he looks entirely different. Put a lot of work in the offseason. Him and Rayleigh will be in, in left field. Uh, Mitch Hanniger, you'll probably see Kenzone split left and right to keep Hanniger healthy and right because Hanniger's had a really healthy spring. Five home runs and a 1,400 OPS. Is, that's You can't ignore that. And I know it's Arizona. I was down there actually this year for, for, uh, for spring training. So um, that was interesting to see. But Everything that this team is built upon starts with number 44, Julio Ra, Ra Rodriguez. It's, you know, you guys obviously know everything. I'm sure I don't have to say much about Julio, but he's in the MVP. If he doesn't win MVP this year, I will be shocked by it. I'm anticipating a massive season for Julio. I'm, I could see 45-45 this, this year for him. You know, last year he was 30-30. And he kind of like what you guys talked about with Devers previously with just the mental getting himself ready to go. He was just kind of out of sync. That's what we saw from Julio to begin the year. Had the crazy tour in August where he set, you know, that 17 hits and four game record. But uh, the Mariners go as far as Julio Rodriguez takes them, you know, and it's it's a, it's a true pleasure and a joy having him here in Seattle and uh, him with the Super Smash Bros in the outfield. He might not be as muscular as Tyler O'Neill uh ex mariners legend forever um but no this will be a fun series and the outfield in general will be something to, to keep an eye on and uh and and again canzone that's it right there you know uh, if i watch any any of these games and see canzone hit a home run and drop the bat and go like this i'll be set for life it'll happen but, so but uh dc Let's sit there and talk about this, uh, the, our Super Smash Brothers and uh, Sedone Raffaella. All right. Yeah, I'll uh, talk about those three. I'll just throw a little caveat, or not a caveat, but uh, a little bit on Abreu as well. But I'll start in left field. I think Duran gets some time there. Um, the thing with Duran is he's very streaky, streaky. I mean, he had a really decent on-base percentage last year. Uh, he did get hurt, which I think ended up uh, – that was going to be a good season for him. He steals bases, and a dude just slams doubles. That's what he does. You know, and um, obviously, like I said, the steals, I think it's something that the Red Sox hasn't, haven't had in a while is a, a guy, you know, a bunch of guys that can steal 20, 25 bags. So I think if he can stay healthy, um, maintain the other stuff he has going on outside the game, I think he has a really solid year. Um, center field, Rafaela, obviously, um, he just has to adjust to major league pitching. He didn't have too many uh, at bats last year. I think, you know, he comes in, he might scuffle a little bit, you know, hopefully people don't give up on him too quickly. Like a lot of people did with Casas, unfortunately. Um, but the thing with him, he's, he's got some raw power for his size. He's like five, four, you know, five foot, 845 pounds. And he's got a lot of speed, you know, so common theme in the outfield. like I said, that we haven't had um, right field, Tyler O'Neill. He's played over a hundred games one time in his life. And I think 90 last or not sure when the last time he played 90, but his top was 138 one year, 90, and then the rest were like 60, 70. But he's got raw power. His speed metrics are above average. If he can stay healthy, I think he could have a 20, you know, 20 season. And then we have Abreu. Um, I think that will definitely be rotating in and out, especially if there are injuries, because unfortunately, you know, two of those three that I just mentioned do have uh, injury or injury prone. Um, but he gets on base. He's got sneaky power. He'll hit some doubles. Um, but overall, I think uh, I think the outfield is going to do a lot more than, you know, what people are expecting. And like I said, there's a good, you know, 60 bags right out there with the the first three that I mentioned. And, you know, if you get big guys on base, and, you know, move them around, anything can happen. And um, decided to watch all of them. And I am excited to see how uh, Abreu does rotate in and out. Yeah, uh, I know, DC, I want to touch one thing. Because a lot of people are, are, are saying that if Jaron Duran – now, George, Rob said that on your 20 – 24 outlook show 
that if Jaron Turan can get some more, a little more power uh, and a couple more home runs, he could be looking a little bit like Jacoby Ellsbury with the speed and the power and be able to drive the ball. If, if we could get somebody even close to Ellsbury besides, you know, uh, leaving to go in the Yankees and making money, I think to this day from the Yankees still, uh, Straight robbery. You know, th- th- oh, that'd be, you know, yeah, that'd be really, really, really great. So, yeah. uh, last but not least, we're going to be sitting there touching real quick on the bullpen. Now, uh, George, you got the bullpen. You talk about mm-hmm. our, you know, three headed monster at, at the back of the bullpen, but also I want to touch base on what you and DC think real quick. On uh, and Dakota, you know this guy well, Bernardino. Like he got optioned down to Triple A. You know, there's no really you know, rhyme or reason why. Uh, so, DC, what did you and George think about uh, Bernardino? We'll start with you, George, uh, being optioned down uh, after having a pretty solid spring training. I was shocked. I was shocked. I, I thought the Sox were going to carry two lefties. Um, you know, I thought. Joel Rodriguez had maybe done enough to be the second lefty, but Bernardino, I mean, he did he done absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, he, he had a good spring. I think I think it became a numbers game, and he had options. But yeah, I, I was like, what? You know, that made no sense to me. And then when he goes, Joel gets lit up in his one of his last spring training outings. So yeah, shocked me a lot. I, I, I know Andrew Parker said that because uh, the Woo Sox had their press day today and they said everybody was swarming around Bernardino you know he's just a great guy to talk to great guy in the clubhouse so DC what were your thoughts on on hearing about Bernardino uh confused you know same as George kind of perplexed over that um I thought he had one of those spots in the bullpen um but he seems like a positive dude you know he he took it on his chin and that's the way you want to see them react um I think he'll be up in no time Okay, Dakota, you, you've had uh, a lot of uh, Bernardino experience. Uh, well, what were what were your thoughts on not being able to see him uh, in the series opener? And you know, what was your experience with him out in Seattle? Because that was a sneaky, sneaky thing that when we got Bernardino. Yeah, I'll be honest. I wasn't really stoked when they, when they cut him, uh, just based upon depth, left-handed pitching, and the bullpen is such a important but hard thing to find especially in this current day lefty specialist you know with the out uh the out the three outs minimum it's harder to find that value but brennan was such a good guy here i mean he came in we literally picked him off off the scrap heap we threw him into our we call our lab our pitching lab and um i just i'm glad for you guys that he's with you you know with you know with boston versus you know with a team that can compete and you know, he can get a starting role with that. But no, definitely a little bit of a bittersweet pill on that one. Uh, Brennan was such, he was a really good guy, really good veteran. Even for not being here that long, he earned a lot, lot of respect in our clubhouse. And I'm sure he'll do the same for you guys in Boston. Okay. Now, Dakota, let's sit there and talk about your bullpen. You talked about who, uh, you know, you said that was going to be getting your uh, totally nasty award was your closer. So, uh Tell us a little bit about about the rest of the bullpen that you've got there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, first and foremost, when you talk about the Mariners bullpen, it starts with the fact that Matt Brash is hurt. Um, He is rehabbing back, which is huge because his value is he's one of the top five bullpen arms in all of baseball. There's no question. Um, But between that and we acquired Gregory Santos from the White Sox, who has just volatile, nasty stuff. I've never seen a dude throw a slider 96 miles an hour. But um. No, I mean, the bullpen really comes and goes. You know, we talked about Munoz earlier, but it goes on the line of Saucedo. You have Austin Voth for, for long relief. There's a handful of guys. Gabe Spire, fun fact, he led um, all of pitchers in the history of baseball since the StatCast era on first pitch strike percentage. He had over 70% strike percentage. So wow. he'll be vital for the, the for this upcoming year. And they have a couple of new guys coming into town here. Uh, Tyson Miller, Cody Bolton. Uh, you guys might know Trent Thornton from his time with Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That would be a name to watch as well. But, and then, of course, we just acquired Ryan Stanek, which is just still a weird thing for me to say out loud, considering he's Houston. But, uh, no, the bullpen looks good. And when we get our, our other guys back, this bullpen is going to be, in my opinion, 
the best bullpen in baseball, and there's absolutely no question at all. Most of the time, Dakota, when I sit there and talk to you know writers, podcasters, and stuff like that, I'm like, man, if we can get to the bullpen, like if we if we can get like the, if we had can get your starters out of the game into the bullpen, we have a chance. But if we if we knock out one of your starters, we it's we might as well just keep them in there. Yeah, because some, because some of your bullpen arms are worse than your starters is. You know what I mean? And and I can 100% see why you wanted to give your totally nasty award, you know, to your closer. Yeah. So I mean, Andres Munoz is, you know, he is one of the weirdest, funkiest pitchers I've seen. You know, total science nerd guy, but uh. No, the bullpen for the pitching is the strength of the Mariners team this year. We will ride it as far as it goes between him and Julio Rodriguez. So the bullpen is uh, – this the sky is the, is the limit, really. One wants to, if we can get Brash back, that will be huge. And getting Santos back will be huge as well. But we're in a really good spot going forward. Okay, George, let's, let's take it home now with our bullpen. Rick re- referenced the three-headed monster at the end of the pen. Uh, we'll back it up. It's uh, Jensen in the ninth, Martin in the eighth, and Josh Winkowski in the seventh. Um, Martin, uh, you know, terrific setup, man. I mean, he had, you know, phenomenal year last year, following up a, a, a great uh, stint with the Dodgers uh, before he came to before he came to the Red Sox. Kenley Jansen. Professional calls have been around a long time, been doing it a long time. Um, both of them got a, you know started off a little slow, uh, but last week or so they've kind of gotten into games. Uh, both had eleven pitch efforts the other day. looked so, looked solid. That's you know that's eight and nine. The the secret weapon of that is going to be Josh Winkowski, who they gave a shot to make uh, part of the rotation this year. Starting pitcher coming up through the minors last year went into the bullpen. 60 appearances out of the pen. He was electric at times. He has just, he, he he's able to like turn it up a dial when, as, a, as a reliever. And he was really effective, you know, seventh, seventh, eighth inning. So he was, you know, he was a bridge to the end and very, and a very good one at that. So, yeah, I, I think we do have a three headed monster at the end. I think, that, you know, uh, if we, you know, turn over a lead, we get the starting rotation, you know, to get us to the seventh, seventh inning, we got three guys who can go out there and deliver. You know, we'd like to thank you for um, giving us Isaiah Campbell. Um, I think he's going to make a very good use of that. Um, you know, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we picked up Chase Anderson, uh, veteran on, not going to hurt us any. Um, Slayton, the kid we got uh, in a trade, uh, rule five pick, um, Hasn't done a lot to uh, make any believe he doesn't belong. Uh, Weissett we got is is part of uh, Verdugo trade, um, and then Joely Rodriguez, who I think will be back in Worcester uh, within seven to ten days after the the first of the year. Um, the first, at the first week of the season. Thank you, Brennan. You know, welcome back to Boston. Uh, and then. You know that's that's our bullpen, and, and I think it's a good bullpen. You've got a you have a, a mix of arms there. You get some veteran, you get some young kids. Uh, we talked a little bit on the preview show the other night. Uh, we've got Liam Hendricks on. Yeah, had a low cost deal for us, and he's coming off of uh, surgery, uh, so you know he's kind of going to be a uh, deadline pickup when he comes back in August, but start the season, this is a very, you know, th- this should be a very consistent, um, good bullpen for the Red Sox and one of the strengths of the team. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I said it a million times on here and a lot of people are like, Oh, you're too hard on AC. The man bulls through blows through oh, he's a bullpen, bullpen killer. And, and, and burns them out. So, but if our pitchers can stay healthy and, if they can take uh, the next step forward, like Cutter Crawford, uh, I'm I'm saying he's taking the next step. He's going to get 170, 175 innings pitched this year. You know, and that's a big step for him, but it has to be done. Like if you want to be 
a starting pitcher in, you know, Boston, you've got to be able to sit there and pitch a minimum 175 innings, you know, easy. So uh, to finish this up, we're going to be going for MVP and also what your what the series record will be. So we're going to do these both at the same time. We're going to start with you, DC. Who is your series MVP, and what do you think the record will be of the Boston Red Sox uh, leaving Seattle? I'm going to go with uh, Rafael Devers. I think he uh, continues his hot spring. You know, I think he could probably – I think he hits two bombs, drives in some runs. Um, I'm looking at him to be the MVP. And then I say I'd probably 2-2, two, two, split the series. Seattle, you know, just like Dakota said throughout the podcast, is that pitching, you know, I think they have us out, uh, outmatched as far as starters, um, starting off with Castillo. I think he's a stud. Um, Kirby, Gilbert. Um, and then uh, that bullpen is disgusting. Uh, but I think 2-2, two, two, I think some close games, maybe one gets a little lopsided. Not sure which way it goes, but I'd be happy to leave Seattle 2-2. Two, two. West Coast uh, games, you know, to start the season kind of scare me, so... You know, if we can just uh, get out of their 500, I think they'll be in good shape. Okay, love the pick, Dakota. Let's go to let's go to you. Uh, who's going to be your series MVP, and what do you think Seattle's going to be uh, coming out of the series with? Well, I mean, for me, my series MVP, I'm going to go with Mitch Haniger. Haniger had an incredible spring, uh, like I referenced earlier, 1400 OPS, five home runs. Uh, just looks a lot more fluid in the outfield and keeping him healthy is so important to make sure that, you know, that series MVP can actually come to fruition. But uh, I'm going to go three, one. The only game that really concerns me with this is uh, the game four, just because we don't know what to expect from Bryce Miller. Obviously Castillo, Kirby and Gilbert are, they're locked in, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do, but you know, what Miller is the question mark. We'll see what happens, but I probably lean three, one, um, two, two is probably a little bit more realistic, but considering, I just don't know what to expect from, from, from Bryce Miller. I'm going to lean three, one in this series. Okay. Very respectable. Uh, George. MVP Trevor story. I think that, uh, he goes deep a couple of times. Um, we'll make a, have a web gem at some point, uh, over the series. And as far as the record, uh, I'm with DC. I think 2 2. Okay. Well, I see the stat out there. So I've got, I, I think Rob's the one that put it out there. So I'm going to be going with the unpredictable one Series MVP, Tyler O'Neill. Whoa. I, I'm, okay. I, I think, we got that one clip too, or what? Rich's going to rip, man. I respect oh, yeah. that. I think, I think uh, Rob, put, Rob put a tweet, uh, tweet out there that said that he's had, I think, four consecutive opening day uh, home runs. This would be f uh, the fifth. I think Rob's the one that put it out there. Uh, and I, I'm i going to sit there, and he's going to pick up the team. He, you know, He's going to put it on his back. And I'm picking Tyler O'Neill as the series MVP. And we're gonna be going uh, two two. I, I I sit there and think if we can get out of here easy with a two two split, going to to Oakland, the city that no one wants to come on because there are no fans. There so, are a lot of possums though. Uh, what was that, Dakota? There's lots of possums in Oakland. You don't have to worry about people. There's possums everywhere though. So, uh, so, <laughs> so but guys, uh, hey. Dakota, thanks for coming on to help us uh, take care of, uh, not really take care of, but go over the Seattle series. Opening day is 25 hours and 20 minutes counting, I'm guessing I'm thinking right. So I'm really, really excited for this. It's been a long time coming. Uh, DC, George, thanks for sitting there and, and being a part of this, like always. Uh, this will be our first full season together, all three of us, and it's going to be a fun one. So, guys, make sure you sit there and head on over to our website. Starting tomorrow, opening day, we got 50% off all of our merchandise. Make sure you sit there. Bam, QR code right up there above DC to the my, uh, to your right. right. Yep. 
Uh, yep. Click the QR right. code, head on over to our store. And, you know, tomorrow, 50% off anything that is baseball related, our shirts. Uh, we've got the Me Casas, the Sue Casas. It's story time, baby. Uh, the DWO, Devers World Order, Halkamania, which I'm a little disappointed. Uh, we don't get to talk about Tanner Halk this episode. But, uh, man, and, or you can just go old school and get yourself a pesky podcast hoodie. You can get a shirt. You know, we, we've even got the uh, the tank tops out there now for, for the sun's out, guns out. So, but guys, make sure you head on over to YouTube. Follow us. Uh, we're on all major platforms, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you sit there and get your podcasts. But for DC, for the OG, for Dakota, we want to really thank you for coming on. We thank really you. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Uh, and when the Mariners come back to the, in the place at Fenway, we're definitely going to be reaching out to you and your buddy that hooked us up. So, but guys, check us out next time. This Saturday, yes, Saturday, when we bring on a special guest. So check us out next time on the Pesky Podcast.